debut book, Skyscrapers of the Midwest, was nominated for an Ignatz Award. His book, Driven by Lemons, is a challenging and deeply personal exploration of unstable psychological states. We talked about how creating Driven by Lemons informed his breakout book, Not Away, which was on many top 10 lists in 2016, and how reading a random article about the transference of consciousness into an electronic medium provided the spark for the Not Away series which is this massive, expansive story that considers the reductio ad absurdum possibilities of that sort of still science fictional but increasingly more plausible technology. He says that he wishes he could find the specific article that sparked the idea for Not Away, but also seems to suggest that it's less important than just being open to the things in the world that are going to click with you. Incidentally, I really like the way that he admitted he can't exactly explain how his stories develop. He says it's mostly intuitive and compares his creative process to a rock tumbler, in the sense that there's this necessarily indeterminate process of refining your ideas. One of the things he notes, and I think this is relatable for any artist or writer, is that he now feels more confident with his rendering of this epic story, and that he attributes that level of confidence right now that he feels to the experience of being in one place, in a fixed space with a reliable routine. That might not work for everyone, other people might be a little bit more nomadic, but I'd say that I, I function in the same way. The second installment in the Not Away series, released in 2021, advances the plot in exhilarating ways. To give you a sense of what the books are about, since I really tried to avoid spoilers in this interview, here's a summary from Multiversity Comics. Not Away is set on a near-future version of Earth. A deep space transport has been developed to take a small crew to an Earth-like habitable planet in a nearby system in an attempt to begin colonization and repopulation. The internet is now telepathic and referred to as the internet. When the hub is revealed to be a human child, Melody McCabe is hired to develop a new nexus to replace that human hub. The books are really beautiful, and I asked Cotter a number of questions about his specific cartooning style. The wireframe chaos that has become sort of a trademark, for example, is rooted in a dedication to representing psychological states that can't be expressed in words. It was amazing to hear that while these panels seem to be frenetic and out of control, they're actually conscious, controlled experiments in abstraction. We talk about how those choices are always in the service of the story, despite the temptation, at times, to lean heavily into the aesthetics of splash panels and spectacle. Overall, he says the goal is to explore the true costs of technology without resorting to a kind of didacticism. I think the books definitely do that. There are these suggestive ideas embedded in the book surrounding technology, you know, the way that it can act as both a source of escapism and serve as a site of destruction at the same time. I'm very excited to speak with you about your work. Um, I'm a huge fan. And uh, I just today rewatched your conversation with Noah Van Skyver. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just, you know, obviously trying to pick up on some things that maybe I could run with a little bit. And, you know, the, the one thing that really stood out is this this moment where you talk about using the the medium of graphic storytelling to process social change mm. uh, and the events of recent years. Like you talk about how cartooning is a way of, or maybe not precisely cartooning, but, you know, art is a way of problem solving on paper, which is a phrase I really liked. Um, and so like reading that insight alongside your book, Driven by Lemons, like I can see how often you're engaging in exactly that thing of like trying to problem solve on paper. Um, and you're like really drawing the reader in to your own experimentation, which is, I think, a characteristic of your work. Um, it so, is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, it didn't start out intentionally. So I, I didn't start making comics, uh, thinking they would help me, um, sort through my issues, but working on my first book, skyscrapers of the Midwest, I found that that's what it was doing. Uh, I was, I, you know, we, most, most of us have childhood issues and, uh, I found that by, by, put by working through them on paper and uh writing and drawing it kind of got it out of my system uh mm -hmm. so from that point on that well after skyscrapers I've, i had some i had some uh, 
mental health issues and I was really just struggling. And, um, I, I was like, well, the skyscrapers worked for childhood stuff. Let's see if drawing helps with, um, with this. And it, it seemed to, so I, I I'm, I, I'm just going to keep going with it. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I like, it's clearly driven by lemons is, is, you know, cathartic to read. And I can't even imagine what it must've felt like to like pour that out. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it remind me a little bit of like Michelle Gondry's film about Noam Chomsky is the man who is tall, happy, you know, which is like this grandiose animated documentary. Like, oh, I, don't, I don't believe I ever saw it. Oh, it's fantastic. Gondry gets obsessed with Chomsky's work and decides I need to make this film to visually capture these abstract ideas and try and make them relatable. You know, I see you doing a lot of that kind of free play in your work. I do do that. And yeah, not not a way is kind of my way of dealing with not only my issues, but but uh, getting a handle on um, many world issues as well. And if you know, not I can't we, we can't do anything about it until we can make sense of it. And there's a lot of nonsense and confusion, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, and um, it's I don't know if I figured out anything yet, but I, I feel like I'm getting a better handle on what's happening. Mm-hmm. And I totally want to come back to. You know, this idea that in some ways the Not Away series is like for me a parable for like the information age in many ways. Like there's there's so many connections to uh, contemporary problems that you're working through. But to stay on this kind of question, I guess, of messiness and abstraction, um, Mm -hmm. I love this tendency in your work to include just like chaotic wireframe images Mm -hmm. all over the place. And it like I didn't realize it, it like kind of originates. I don't know if it originates, but you're doing it in Driven by Lemons. Yes, it did. It did origin, originate. Yeah, uh, it's a way of, it's a means of expressing psychological states that aren't necessarily uh, easy to describe with words. Uh, and I, I found that it, it, that's what it is for me. And I don't know exactly what it communicates to others, hmm. um, but it, it is it is trying to explore deeper psychological states uh, rather than just the facade of uh, something that's happening, what's going on underneath. And uh, it's, I mean, of course I enjoy drawing that way too. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it while I was doing Driven by Lemons and I wanted to incorporate it into future work. And I've, I've found a way to allow, to bring abstraction into my work without it seeming coming or being too indulgent. I wanted it to have a narrative purpose. And uh, that's my intention with the abstractions and not a way. Yeah. What's clear to me, at least as a reader, is that you're trying to experiment with more or less rendering fractured consciousness as like, not yes. just not just like a doomed state, but almost a kind of like psychedelic state, a state of like transubstantiation where you're not quite yourself, you know? And there's no control. With, with yeah. the body, we have so much right. more control. But when it comes to the mind, uh, and at least from my experience, there are times where you can't control your mind and mm-hmm. there's a lot of frustration involved with that. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a way of representing, representing those, those things that can't, that can't be handled objectively. Uh, I feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think what it, it questions, what objectivity even really like is true, true, true. And you, and like, you're clearly leaving room in your work to, I think, be surprised. Like I, I've heard graphic novelists sort of just, you know, talk about this, you you work, I, I know, like, you know, in a very controlled way, but then there's still this room for like improvisation and, and like surrealism and all this stuff. Mm, and, that's the balance I was yeah. trying to find. Yes. Right. Like it's hard to, it's hard to sustain that. Um, and you, like, there's this moment too, in the interview with Nova and Sky, where you say like, in those moments of abstraction, you're letting yourself be more free. It's like this decision to be more free. And I guess like when you're actually drawing those pages, you say you really enjoy it. Like how frenetic is the actual work of making those pages? Is it more controlled than it it's, seems? It's very controlled. It's, it? Uh, okay. it starts, it starts out objectively. Uh, well, it started out how I, how I came to those types of drawings in the first place was, uh, while drawing, I, uh, many artists, myself included, tend to start generally and work towards specific. And generally, you 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 start with gestural drawings uh, to 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 just ca- ca- attempt a, a quick attempt to capture the energy and form of your subject, uh, and then you build up. Uh, 
On top of that, uh, to more specifics, so uh, the object or a subject is, is representational, but I keep it in the gestural stage and I work it over and over again uh, mm. uh, until m- much of much of what is included is no longer recognizable. Mm. Um, uh, I got off track with the, the initial question, though. Oh, it's all good. You know, and, and we can keep kind of running with that. Really, you know, like on this point, there are these uh, beautiful wiry panel frames toward the end of volume one of Not Away mm-hmm. that make uh, uh, like conscious use of negative space. Mm-hmm. I guess I want to ask, like, does it take as an artist a kind of courage to leave areas blank? You know, do you have a specific philosophy when you use negative space like that? It does. Uh, yeah. I don't know about courage, but <laughs> it, I know what you mean. Cause I, I come from the mad, the mad school of drawing, right. uh, the Will Elder, the Wallace Wood, where every, every possible square, you know, inch is, is filled with detail. And I've, I, I enjoy mm-hmm. that. And I, 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 I've been, as I've studied as an artist, uh, grow, uh, growing as an artist, I've realized the, I've learned to appreciate the importance of negative space. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you compare what I'm doing now with some of my early work, you, you, you'll, I think you'll, people might find it a little more, uh, a little more breathing space in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, th- I, I do, I, le- I've realized that negative space can contribute to the narrative and overall um uh, feel of the book itself and mm-hmm. and uh, with the second book taking place on earth uh with in, in primarily in the midwest with its wide midwest uh, us with its wide open spaces i found an opportunity to uh to experiment more with negative space and and yes it it, it i'm out of my comfort zone when i'm doing it but uh working on volume 2 i i found uh that my work can benefit from that as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll jump ahead because I want to ask actually about like certain stylistic choices in Not Away 2. Like, you know, you, it is set on Earth. And so you have the uh, these opportunities to kind of, um, you know, create what in film would be called almost establishing shots. Mm-hmm. And what you're like, what I think is interesting about your book and, you know, other people do it to some extent, like I think of Seth or or people like that. Like you're, you actually choose to place those establishing shots in these really small panels a lot of the time. <laughs> and so there's this like playful minimalism where you want to kind of like, you want to dive into those small panels to make them kind of fill up your field of vision. And I was looking today at your Instagram and you have a preliminary sketch from Not Away Volume 3 on there mm-hmm. that seems to continue that technique. Like, how did you maybe develop that where, you know, and was there ever a temptation to make these beautiful landscapes, big splash pages to appeal to the reader? Or was that what you're trying to do? I think I have to, I think you have to do whatever serves the story. Uh, there's temptations to do more splash pages. Like in not in volume two, I did allow that, especially at the beginning when I was establishing Chicago and having uh, the, uh, the bodies float into the city. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's an opportunity for those large, to indulge myself in those larger drawings but there are also times where i need to make sure that it's not overwhelming the story like it it, it can establish the shot but it doesn't need it and it's all it's all entirely intuitive uh, as i go along and i'm drawing these things i'm like what serves the story best and whether i'm making the correct decision or not is you know it's it's left up to the reader but uh yeah i would love to do two page spreads all the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just enjoy letting loose and doing these large drawings, but um, yeah. it really it comes down to what I feel serves the story best. Right. And in terms of the story, like in, in this sprawling sci-fi opus, like you, you talk about how the inspiration for it originally came from a scientific article on this future possibility of transferring the human mind to a hard drive. Now mm-hmm. I don't want to like enter spoiler country and like, divulge what's going on in the story for those that haven't read it and everybody should read it because it's so much fun but you know you talk about how like that article opened up all these possibilities for you it was it was a click it was a click moment definitely i i I honestly it was it's probably been 15 years since i read that article and i wish i wish i knew what it was because there there have been a number of articles written since about Mm -hmm. the uh digitization of consciousness uh and you know with uh experimentation with uh re- reading pig's thoughts and stuff it's it's we're on our way to happening but yeah it's uh it was certainly whatever article that was and i was reading scientific american at the time so it's good it's a good possibility it was in there mm-hmm. uh but um 
it's uh yeah it's uh, i guess you can't control what's going to click with you and that and that moment i realized that i want it's something i i, I felt really interested in and i wanted to explore more uh, and did you fiction. feel like you is, and did you feel like you kind of saw the whole story like in that moment or oh it, no 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 not in the yeah, moment you, you i just, just piqued your curiosity yeah yeah that'd be amazing if that happened Wouldn't that be, yeah. <laughs> that's not uh, how it works so. it was a, yeah it was a very long process and right. really the the story started out uh but the story started out with anthropomorphic characters like uh, skyscrapers. And I, I realized fairly quickly that I, I wanted to tell the story in a different way. So it developed, I, I started like getting ideas for it when I read that article. And I'm guessing that was 07, 08. And I just kept a separate sketchbook where I, where I jot down ideas and stuff. And, and the, explaining how stories develop has always been difficult because it's so complex and it takes place over such right. an extended period of time but it was it was very much a slow building process and after a couple of years of of thinking it over and th- and looking at ideas from different angles then then the story the not story of not away started taking form yeah i mean um you don't want to put the cart before the horse it's going to come from the process itself exactly um, yeah, yeah yeah a lot of it comes from just the process of sitting down and and, and not just sitting not just actively working on it but I, I i don't know how else to describe it uh but i it's like a tumbler a rock tumbler and i i in my head and i throw all these ideas in there and they kind of sometimes they get polished and i can see them better and i see how they fit together with each other and it's just sometimes it just takes uh, letting things roll around in my head for a while. Uh, and mm-hmm. then I find that things even start falling in place if I give it time. And then like the result of it is that you put in the work to produce this book and then kind of almost ironically, it's read in a flash, right? Yeah. Like, they are read quickly. But the the point of it is, I think like, you know, graphic novels as a visual medium are analogous to the film in the way that they do give us a means of kind of doing this thought experiment, right? As, as viewers, as, as an audience. And, and so like what you're exploring in not a way is really like, yeah, the, the, the possibilities of maybe, I mean, like people like Dmitry Itzkoff and the 2045 initiative, like it's about trying to achieve immortality by transferring consciousness. You know, Westworld is a show that in sure. part is, is trying to figure out um, how to render this narratively. And like there's books, you know, academic books, like in human power, um, that are about like artificial intelligence that say like those thought experiments are really important in terms of like helping audiences do the work of imagining yeah this like future possibility right yeah yeah and and I I don't I don't consider my work so much as predicting uh, like like a uh, like an Arthur C Clarke sure there could be uh, like you know technology that resembles psychic activity in the future I I, I from what I'm understanding it, it's it's quite possible but you know we're, we're nowhere near that technology yet but it's more it's more i get i get i create myself uh, to use a hollywood term uh, a sandbox to play in and the, yeah, this yeah. The, the having those res- restraints those borders of, of to work in but uh i'm getting off track scott i'm sorry i, I do that sometimes <laughs> no uh, <laughs> but i i want to pick up on your love of science fiction right like i love the genre i love the genre yeah yeah, yeah. I, th- I see so many like really difficult problems being grappled with the fact that, you know, in book one, Eva is a young girl and she's the sort of condition of possibility for streaming, you know? And, right. and to me, like thinking about that in relationship to other like patterns in sci-fi, like I see a direct connection to stories like Ursula K. Le Guin's The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas or Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer, even things like Ender's Game. There's a new, there's a book in the new Star Wars High Republic multimedia project called the light of the Jedi that Mm -hmm. uses that same trope of like exploiting suffering as a means of driving some impossible technology. And I guess I wondered, like thinking about these patterns, what do you think is so enticing about that concept in science fiction? Is there something maybe about that moral problem that people were so fascinated by? I don't know. I think it's, well, I mean, I can't speak for the others. I don't know where they, they, but for myself, it's, it's a commentary uh, in a way of, as on on what we're already experiencing i mean we, the technology we enjoy uh mm-hmm. I, it comes it comes it comes, it comes, it comes out as sounding pretty bad but i it's the truth in many ways that the technology we enjoy is built on the slave labor <laughs> it, it, which is essentially slave labor of of people mm-hmm. around the world and it's something i'm conscious of like i i need a computer i need a phone to get through the modern world but i'm also very very conscious of using these objects and 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 
and the way the people that make them are treated. So mm -hmm. there, there's that aspect too. And it, there's, it's not just that, but it, the technology we use today is, it, we're a very privileged nation, the United States and, and much of North America is. And uh, uh, we don't often think about what some of the true costs of our technology are, especially, uh, especially uh, cellular phones or, or mm -hmm. large, sc large screen plasma televisions or whatever else it's uh, someone might be suffering for our pleasure. And that it's something I try to stay conscious of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Marxists call that reification, you know, you kind of uproot the thing you're using, you're consuming from the whole supply chain. But you know, what's interesting, of course, about the pandemic is how, the supply chain has become kind of visible to us, you know, very like, much. Yeah. It's yeah. something I've been thinking about a lot and, and, and it's, I've, I've tried to consume even less. I mean, I was, I was raised a consumer. I was raised to think it was for not, I'm not, not necessarily my parents, but just a, in society that sure. this was how things were done. And, and, and with the, uh, climate crisis with, with people not being paid livable wages, it's, uh, and so on and so on. And, and now of course, being forced to go out to work and risking their lives for stuff that we don't really need for the most part, mm -hmm. it's something I'm very conscious about. And in the last couple of years, like you said, it's become much more apparent that these systems, uh, they're, you know, they, 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 uh, maintain systems of inequality and mm -hmm. it's, uh, we're still a part, I'm not, and I say that as uh, criticizing it as I am a part of it, but I'm right. kind of with this book is another thing I'm working through is like, how do I take a step back? How do I not participate in a system that's harmful for others? Yeah, I mean, um, it's so it's virtually impossible not to be contaminated by it, right? You're implicated by it. And really? what I, you know, what I love about your books is like, there's not uh, the sense that you're like, aloof and above these things right there is this sense that you're implicated but also it's not particularly like preachy or polemical it's it's all very subtle like for example you know the eternity space station it's not clear whether that is privately or publicly owned right in the context of like you know our uh moment you know i i thought a lot when when kind of reflecting on that about this weird contemporary space race among billionaires uh -huh. <laughs> you know yeah. And like, there's so many things that I sort of saw these resonances with, like, there's a moment early on in volume one, where a conservative talk show host is questioning their guest on the possibility of terrorists and hackers, exploiting Chinese the internet. terrorists. Yeah, yeah, straight up <laughs> out of like Trump vilifying bite dance and all this stuff. You know? Exactly. And then that's the thing. It hasn't, I can imagine it being like that, you know, in the decades to come. I, I have a tendency to want to be didactic. Uh, and uh, I, I resist that because especially with social media and over the last decade, we're like we, we confront each other with these like statements of like of being right. And it's sure. the state it's the state of humans needing to be right that I, I am very curious about. And I'm also exploring because we can't all be right. And I, I, again, I, I guess it goes back to concepts of right and wrong being a very human thing because there really is mm -hmm. no such thing it's like whatever goes against my belief system is wrong so uh mm -hmm. i guess i guess i'm trying to explore many of these things in a less didactic way by by making them more subtle by by presenting rather than uh shoving down someone's throat i think it's a better way to make an argument there was a book i read recently called uh not recently it was last year called the uh the understory uh and uh, he oh, makes yeah. a, it was about it's about the the, the, the potential of ecological uh, collapse. Mm -hmm. And um, he makes a point that in it that like if you want to change minds, you need to tell a story. And that, that really stuck with me because I, I think that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to. Well, I, th I think that's what any any really great stuff over the years has has done movies, films, music or whatever is it changes. It changes people's minds without without letting them know that that was what's going on you know yeah 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 um absolutely like i think like we're we're seeing the ways in which didacticism like there's a limit to its effect absolutely right and and so like i think that's why like i love the opening scenes of not away two where walt and aveline are are like having this philosophical conversation and walt says like i feel we have a responsibility to be reasonable to believe mm. in facts and so on but it's like it's clear he's not <laughs> he's not like certain of that idea it's like no. something he has a sense of you know 
Yeah, I use, I use that scene to express kind of the core philosophy behind the series, that that whole roof scene. And I knew that was the point where I was getting a little wordy and there's basically a 10 page conversation and I might lose people. So I figured the only way I could make that work is if they were drunk. Because, uh, of course, drunk people, yeah. you know, you get, you get talking about philosophy all the time. Totally. So, yeah. But uh, enthusiastically. <laughs> enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. Enthusiastic philosophy. So that scene was my way of of kind of putting forward the the philosophy of the series but but doing it in a way where it seems just like a couple intoxicated people conversing and the other thing to me that makes that scene so believable is the fact that there there's sexual chemistry there's this complex sexual chemistry it's it's libidinally mm-hmm. charged like you can the way in which Walt's gaze is depicted <laughs> viewing Aveline's body like and and this is something that I see in both books like there's a sense of how sexuality mediates in relationships that seems really sure. crucial for the books. And like, I have this, this theory specifically about the plot point in book one of serious hiring conventionally attractive people. <laughs> like my theory is that he does that. Cause you can just drop that into the story. Right. Uh-huh. My, my theory is that he does that so that they'll be distracted by one another and will just like passively accept what he's doing. That's quite possible. That's uh, I see. I see where you're coming. I'm not going to say anything because because the third the third volume does uh, return to Sirius and his assistants. Uh, right. So, uh, but uh, I'd say I'd say that's a that's a pretty pretty good theory. You know, just thinking <laughs> internal internal to the story, like what's going on, right? At the same time, there is that there is that sexual aspect uh, mm-hmm. or the uh, sexuality in the books. Which if people reading the books, they may not actually catch on. But there is, I think it's it's a very huge, enormous part of human behavior. Yeah, yeah. Reproduction on a biological level, uh, sexual reproduction is our biological purpose. If if you want to get down to like uh, a natural, you know, level of things, not, not not to say that people need to reproduce. This this is these are totally you know. Yeah, but yeah. As far as far as as far as biological functions go, I think much of what we do is in service of sexual reproduction. Which you sound a little bit like Oscar Isaac in Ex Machina, <laughs> like the way that he talks about sexuality. Of course, he's like a villainous character. Yeah, but he, he's like almost weaponizing that notion of of human sexuality as a way of, you know, creating this asymmetrical relationship. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think I think a lot of people do. Totally. I mean, think about yeah. how much sexuality has been weaponized and how much it's been used for for the the incredible propulsion of capitalist system, systems in just the last century. You know, yeah, it's a uh, sex is a huge part of it. But it's like I'm also I'm also gr- uh, grew up on a farm in the Midwest, so I'm always nervous about like showing nudity and stuff. So you know, it's it's complex complex on my end as well. But I do re- objectively recognize it as an important part of the human experience, and so it's 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 always there among my characters and that i gotta say like that's sort of what's uh, you know funny about the ways that the books represent bodies uh, you know like the the cover of the first book mm-hmm. that was uh, you know an interesting choice but it's not it's not like comic book cleavage if you know what i mean like it's not like I marvel over the top hyperbolic implausible cleavage instead there's like texture and physicality and corporeality that you like given the textural nature of your style, maybe inevitably are going to, you know, that's going to be how you represent bodies, but they're not clean. There's nothing clean about them. No, and that's, really like. I was a little nervous about putting Melody nude on the front cover because I thought it might mm-hmm. be perceived as sexual objectification. But my intention is on the cover is all seven volumes. The protagonist of each volume is going right. to be nude and, I'm going to show them words and all, you know, and that's show yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And if you go from the front, which is the physical aspect of the person to the rear, which is the psychological aspect of the person, it, there's kind of a spectrum there on the cover. So my mm-hmm. intention was to show the character each, of each volume in their full spectrum. And, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, but yeah, it's, uh, I, the, the, there's, there's that aspect of comics that tends to be the mainstream comics where it's just all very sexually suggestive poses uh jumping yeah. over a, uh, the camera point of view so you have this like spread spread legged shot with like heaving cleavage and that that stuff just doesn't interest me i i prefer i prefer to look at the human body as realistically as possible and uh my yeah. my, my work's not meant for titillation i guess is uh, whereas mm-hmm. whereas some work is intended for titillation sure um, and similarly, I think like the violence, the moments of pain and suffering, like there's nothing indulgent really about them, you know, like 
they you're you're trying to often just convey like the actual material impact of what's happening and and you know the reader feels those moments of violence really intensely which is surprising given the the pen and ink style right you're not even using color there's a there's a I know there's a tendency when drawing uh, violence to get to gratuitous and I make I make a conscious effort to not glorify it not not do anything which would make it look cool or you know fun right. and it's like I, it's because violence isn't I I, I I it's fun to watch in films and stuff but I uh, for for many people but I personally wouldn't want that visited up in my upon my own life and I right. and I, I I want to I want to treat it as objectively and realistically as possible. Because otherwise, there tends to be a romanticizing of violence, I think, and uh, and that can be pretty dangerous. Yeah, and you know, I, I you know, I've kind of done a one eighty in my own, you know, because I I grew up as a teenager really worshiping, you know, um, films like Natural Born Killers, like Oliver oh, sure. Stone films, yeah, Tarantino, Tarantino whatever, yeah, Tarantino, just this vis- visceral, cartoony violence, yeah, yeah. Um, but now, you know, it, it, there's, it's okay, I think, to reevaluate culture from the perspective of uh, a kind of, um, you know, hardline pa- pacifist or nonviolent stance, you know? Well, um, yeah, yeah I mean, to assume I've... that it's going to produce violence in the world, <laughs> but to maybe not just acquiesce to violence as spectacle, <laughs> like... Yeah, it's not just spectacle. It's something happened to actual people. And that's what I'm trying to convey. Whereas, yeah, the other are movies where p- people are being gunned down by the dozens. And it's like, they're just objects in this film, uh, you mm-hmm. know, but but when I'm dealing with real characters and this book, I decided uh, early on, especially that I didn't want to glorify it at all. I wanted it to, sh- to I wanted there to be human impact after the fact that it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a dreaminess to the sexuality. There's a certain a, a, a blunt viscerality, certainly to like the violence, the damage done to bodies. Um, mm-hmm. But then there's also, I think, like um, a way in which like you're trying to uh, sink the reader deeper into uh, uh, the lo- lives of these characters. And one character in particular, I want to ask about. Mm-hmm. I I want to know if you have a name for this this character that runs through both books that i call the mystic <laughs> who is on this this journey in an un- unknown landscape oh the man it, in the desert the man in the desert is he that does, what you call him yeah. that's, that's that's what i'm calling him now just okay. in my notes <laughs> he sure. does have he does have a name uh okay. the name but i won't reveal it because it will be it, it will be re- it will be revealed in the third book but i don't know what he's doing <laughs> you know <laughs> he's he's yeah. definitely he's definitely He's actually fairly central to the story. Uh, I have to think so, yeah. Uh, and he's and I my my decision was was I'm going was a way of having a second story at first in the books that maybe seemed unrelated, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm working to a point with the seventh volume. The seventh and final volume will be about him, and uh, then we'll learn everything about his background. So right. everything's kind of leading up to his story. Awesome. Well, I I mean I pr- I feel like I shouldn't ask about him then, but. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the one thing I guess I want to, uh, you know, I can't help but ask is, you know, and how I how I imagine you're going to answer this question, I don't know. Why do I see him as a mystic? Is it potentially about that famous adage from Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic? I think so. It's like, you know, because he's navigating a, a landscape that doesn't feel like it could be real. You know, yeah, and I, and I and I think I think that's a I think that's a good possibility because the, yeah. that uh, Clark that was another uh, you mentioned er, I mentioned earlier about mm-hmm. how uh, psychic technology uh, is quite possible, but well, it would appear to be psychic. Of course, it isn't. It's all done with electricity, but it would seem like magic to us if it was suddenly to be dropped into our laps. You know, uh, and then with this character, he's uh, yeah, you're right. I got to find a way to ward things without giving anything away, but. Uh, I'd say the mystic is one way, you know, it, it's a fine way to look, look at it, look at him. Uh, but as far as like, he uses some technology. Uh, yeah, that's right. But uh, yeah, I don't know. As far as your point of view goes, I, I, I can't, I can't say. That's it, fair. It, yeah. <laughs> I want to ask a more specific question about the mystic that is about sure. book one. Like the, he, and I think he does it in book two as well. He's watching a commercial for mm-hmm. detergent on repeat. Mm-hmm. And like my thoughts drifted back when I read those scenes to the way that Eva uses Franklin to zone out 
Mm -hmm. uh, seemingly to serve as like an internet hub. So like that's leading me down a whole rabbit hole, that connection. Um, yeah. And the focal, the focal points, I think we all have our focal points with technology. Now it's a way of, it's a way of, of taking a moment to take a break from the, Mm -hmm. the, the difficulties around us. And that's why so many people are spending their time staring at phones or tablets because there's, well, it's hard to say that there's less pain there because a lot of the mm-hmm. times they're going to Twitter and Facebook and those places are pretty painful, uh, yeah. but they can be. Yes. But I think there is also escapism involved and it's just another form of escapism. Uh, yeah. the, the, the mystic I'll, I'll, I'll refer to him as that, uh, <laughs> the mystic, uh, there is a narrative purpose behind the commercials. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with, with, uh, Eva, uh, also being a, a fascinated with Franklin. I think, I think that aspect comes from, uh, my own, uh, my own tendency. And I think a human tendency to, to focus on something that, yeah. uh, helps you get through something you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. Just an alleviation of an alleviation. Of yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a way of leaving pain without taking, you know, drugs or something. Yeah. And that ironically kind of allows your brain to function. <laughs> like yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. Your brain yeah. needs that. But uh, I wanted to, you know, ask about like, uh, just as a storyteller, uh, and this is kind of switching gears, how you think about naming uh, the, the series itself comes from Wink and Blink and a Nod. Um, and, and a few other know, things. I thought of the Pixies song, Gouge Away. Gouge like Away? Like air of aloofness and spaciness. <laughs> Yeah, uh, with naming, I've actually resisted it because I feel like I resist giving things too much definition. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I went with cats, anthropomorphic characters early on is because the more you define it, the less chance you have with a person making a connection with a character. Right. Uh, so, so with giving naming something, you are you are definitely uh, giving it a, a very certain definition, and it will have an effect on the reader's mind. So, but I knew writing a book of the scale, this size, with so many characters, I was going to have to name characters, and uh, a lot of times I I, I use alliteratives uh, to c- continue with the, uh, the the comics aspect. Is a lot Walter of my, W. Walker? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Melody McCabe, exactly. Is Franklin like, Falk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I tend I tend to use a lot of alliteratives, uh, mm-hmm. but I also use puns and uh, even some names describe the character Mm -hmm. in a way, or they describe what's going to happen to a character in a way. So uh, I'm still resistant to naming things, but I decided if I have to do it, I I may as well have a little fun with it to to keep myself. Cause then if you, if the names are atypical, it, and when I I use a lot of atypical names, like savvy, Iota, Mm -hmm. um, serious and earnest, serious. I feel, I feel it. I feel it those specific words mean something to a person and they, and they won't, or to many people right. and, and they won't limit, uh, they won't limit how the audience views the character. Yeah. Like if I named, every, if I named a character Chad and someone hated a Chad, you know, then, then the, that character, yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's, I think, I think that's where I, I came from, from naming because my, 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 uh, I don't really care to do it in the first place. It's something I've, I've had to make myself do. Yeah, well, naming is like, it, it limits for sure what can be said in a way, right? Or what, mm. what can be felt about a character. Okay. Um, you know, like the, the way in which, like I, I wanted to kind of use this maybe as a segue into discussing how these books address religion. I mean, like, you know, religion, uh, uh, spirituality is one thing, but when you start to like name and categorize and d- denominate specific mm-hmm. forms of spirituality, that's when, of course, we get into uh, enormous amounts of trouble, like war and and yeah. conquest and cl- colonization. Um, you, you know, your book, I want to say, for me, lacks clear enemies and heroes. There is like a certain moral ambiguity in the universe of Not Away, but I think religious groups get the most serious criticism uh in some sense well um, yes and i and i yeah. i i'm I, I grew up in the christian church so i have right. many many strong thoughts on christianity especially how christianity is used today uh mm-hmm. i believe i believe a number uh, stuff like this can get me in trouble but i'll go ahead and say it, a number of christians don't actually follow the teachings of christ mm-hmm. uh, 
and I can't speak about any other religion, but I feel that since I was raised Christian, um, and I know what the teachings of Jesus Christ are, uh, I, I, I can, I'm fairly certain that the modern Christian isn't, it doesn't have anything to do with Christ. Not mm-hmm. every Christian. I and mean, that's, that's a, that's a thing I have to say is Trump used police to walk across the street and hold up a Bible. Like, that's exactly certainly... that, that, yeah. that Trump is not a man of Christ. Exactly. Right. So there's an it, immolation of morality happening there. So, so my, my concern with religion and my criticism of religion is using it as a weapon rather and using it for hateful or, or mm-hmm. uh, negative means. And, spirituality is is everybody you know we all have our own thoughts and views on spirituality but but how religion is used it tends to be divisive and that's not that's not the purpose behind religion and and uh, if there was some way we could get away from this we would have far fewer wars my criticism my criticism with organized religion is it usually allows people to justify hurting others, I think, in many, in many ways. Yeah. I, and I wonder, you know, how it'll develop in, in the coming books, you know, like there, if, if book two has a hero, it's perhaps Aveline. I mean, she, in the opening pages is so captivating. Um, and, and you, you, well, I won't spoil anything, but you know, she, in those opening pages is explaining that religion and other, she seems to suggest like uh, virtually any other sense-making structure, maybe mm. nationalism, uh, inhibits the flow of energy, or what she calls vibration. You know, I um, believe it does. So. You know, that's a kind of spiritualism that is about rejecting the naming and categorizing of spiritualism. So, well, and that's and that's what religion is: is we is people have name put names to things that don't need names. Mm. Uh, it's it's. It's it's a very obviously a very human thing to label, and uh, and uh, to to say God is this or God is that or heaven is this or hell is that. No, it's no one knows, you know. It's it's no one no one knows. And to say say with certainty is uh, it, it, that's what leads to conflict because every everybody has different interpretations. Yeah, and I you know I love that the this second book is set on Earth because like to me you know that's that's. If there's a legitimate source of spirituality, it's this idea that the that we are that we can't precisely know the earth, you know, and and so like when the mystic finds his way after a near fatal fall to an <laughs> opening, a rock face that is unmistakably vaginal, he, it's as though he is returning to the womb, like he is he is encountering like the uh, the <laughs> alterity of the earth, you know, he is. Uh... Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I did, and the the cave opening is indeed vaginal. I, and that was partially due to all the phallic towers that were around there. But uh, yeah, he, uh, he. Well, I can't expand too much on that one. But what he he does, he does find what he's looking for in the cave system. Cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've been really, really generous with your time. I just kind of want to ask. Um, Questions about like the like the physical act of doing the job that you do, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, first of all, the project is so ambitious, um, you know, it's this this huge mind bending project, you know, where you are the person that is responsible for produ- producing it is not it's not a film in development hell somewhere. It's a it's, lot. It's yeah. all you. And and you told Noah Van Skyward that you're you're conscious of the whole George R. R. Martin thing. Mm, um, I am. That, yeah. that maybe it won't be feasible to get it all done, especially given the elaborate detail and the painstaking design of the pages. I want to ask, like, how do you ensure you don't destroy your body while drawing? Like Glenn Gould used to soak his hands in hot water before performances. <laughs> you know, Criota Wilberg has that book, Draw Stronger. Do you have like a a regimen that keeps you? Well, I'm get, I am getting—I am getting older. I'm in my mid forties now, and I'm and I'm noticing the damage I've done to my body when I was younger. Because when I was twenty, I would hunch over, sit, on, you know, squat on the floor, sure. cross my legs while I was drawing, whatever. It didn't matter. And 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 now I realize if I could if I could tell any young cartoonist starting out what to do is just sit straight up, still good posture. Because so what I do now, yeah, I have to deal with it. So yeah, I. Throughout this book, I think my back went out four or five times, uh, and of course that keeps me in bed for another week. So I have to find ways to keep working. Uh, right. And yeah, it's just my hands; they seem to be doing fine, okay, fine so far. My eyes are starting to go downhill, and my my glasses are getting thicker and thicker every time I get a new pair. And but uh, 
Yeah, basically, I'm driving my body into the ground with comics, but it's... <laughs> but for our benefit. So yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm enjoying myself, too. You know, it was, it was worth it's it. It's got to be rewarding. It yeah. is. I'm very, I'm very happy with how the book's turning out. And it's uh, just the whole the whole path of being an artist is, has, has been... I'm really glad I've chosen this path because no matter what it's doing to my body, it's... I, I, I couldn't have spent my life any other way and the rewards it's brought brought me and not beyond monetary to, and as as with comics there there really are few monetary rewards but as far as like the things I've I've been able to experience in my life because I've started making comics it's it's been entirely worth the damage I've done uh, well that's great to hear um, and you know I I don't know if it's because I was reading the second book digitally but mm-hmm. it it just felt like your your style your 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 like it really feels like you're you're moving in a more um you know like exp- if not experimental just a uh, more confident direction like you really have a lot of like control i'm personally feeling that control and confidence and i think a lot of it's coming from just finally being in one place and having a place where i can mm-hmm. work and not i i i'm i i've i I rely a hundred percent on routine. And if my routine's uh, disrupted, I'm, I'm a mess. Mm -hmm. Uh, So living here on the farm with my wife and kids, we, we have a pretty much set schedule and we're able, of course with kids, it's not always set, but uh, I, 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 my point is, uh, is I attribute um, my, the confidence I'm finding in my work. I attribute that to being able to just do it every day and not have to work Mm -hmm. a a, a part-time or full-time job and, uh, and just really just dedicating myself to it every day. I don't know. I just confidence without being, uh, without being, I, I don't allow too much proud in it, pride into my heart because <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it can be a little dangerous, but I, I objectively, I am very happy with how things are going and I attribute that to being able to focus. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I can't wait to see book three. Um, yeah. Thanks Scott. I'm, I, uh, I've been writing it for nine months now and I'm just pretty much wrapped up with the writing. So, and like you said, you saw some sketches today and I'm mm-hmm. just kind of getting my hand warmed up and ready to dive back into the world. Mm-hmm. Well, thank goodness that, you know, Fantagraphics found you or you found Fantagraphics, um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm very love- fortunate. Yeah. The Fantagraphics, I've been, I've been, a have been a fan of the, uh, the company since I, you know, re- got into independent comics in the nineties. So it's, uh, it's been kind of a lifelong dream. And I, the main reason I, I talked to Fanta was I knew Ad House wouldn't be a, around much longer and he already did announce he was closing down last year. So, mm-hmm. uh, so the move to Fanta has ended up, ended up being a good move and, uh, I'm glad I'm with them. They're, they're behind me a hundred percent. And, um, and as long as my hands keep working, my eyes keep working, my back keeps working, I'm going to finish the series. Awesome. Uh, Thanks again, Josh, for making the time. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me.